As I said earlier, welcome to the uh, Performance Pathways session tonight. Um, I think, looking at all the names, I think you've all been to our sessions before this week. So welcome again to another session. I hope you've enjoyed it so far this week. Um, I think you all know the house rules by now, so I won't go through them, but they're there on the screen for you to, to read yourself. Um, I'm just going to introduce um, Dan and Alistair, who are um, uh, de delivering the session tonight. Um, first of all, um, Dan, I mentioned last week, oh, so last week, last Tuesday, seems that way, um, when he was doing the Developing Young Triathletes. Uh, Dan started his triathlon journey in 1986. Along the way, he has been the head of uh, head coach of the World Class Start and Potential Programme and of Loughborough Performance Centre. Um, he also was the head man's, uh, men's coach at the Beijing Olympics. He then went and spent some time at the um, English Institute of Sport, delivering performance lifestyle support to athletes on the GB boxing and GB diving world-class program. He then returned to British Triathlon and is currently the Olympic Pathway Manager. Uh, moving over to Alistair, Alistair Donaldson is currently the Paralympic Pathway Manager. Uh, Alistair has been at British Triathlon for eight years. During that time, he has helped to recruit and develop a number of athletes towards the inaugural para triathlon at the 2016 Games in Rio, and of course to this year's delayed Games in Tokyo. He has he has also supported the British team at the World and European Championships. Previously, he was an endurance coach at British Athlete Athletics, supporting the development of elite athletes in the Olympic pathway. So, welcome, guys. Welcome everyone to the session. I'll hand over to Alistair. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, if I haven't met you, um, nice to, to, to virtually meet you. Um, thanks for the intro, Pete. Um, just to get started, um, obviously, I'm going to talk first um, for a little bit about the Paralympic pathway. I'm then going to um, pass, over, pass over to Dan, who's going to talk about the Olympic pathway, um, and then we'll do questions at the end. So um, if you do have any questions, um, within them if you just stick them in the box and I think Pete's going to keep an eye on that for us as yeah. well as I'm sure Dan and I will too um, and then we'll we'll pick up it you can always just drop them in as we go through the presentations and then we'll pick them up at the end and um, to make sure that we don't get sidetracked and, and can get through both presentations and um, one of the things you will find as you come through is um, we use the same terminology all the way through um, on both pathways um, so all the stages of our pathways have the same name, although we do uh, have a slight variation in, in, in terms of what they mean. And that's what Dan and I are going to talk to you about. Um, and that's to fit the, the context of our athletes. So um, rather than chat about that, I will crack on. So this is um, basically is the new Paralympic pathway. Um, some of you will be familiar with, with where we were before. Um, some of you may not. Um, but essentially what I'll actually do is start from the beginning. Obviously clubs are the absolute um, lifeblood of any pathway and, and the real starting point. We then move into our academy program and I'm going to go into that um, in a lot more detail. Um, and from then we move to the next generation program or next gen. Um, again, I'll speak more about that. We then have the next three stages of confirmation podium potential and podium are our world-class program uh, stages of the pathway so that is when the the pathways are truly British rather than home nations um, and at that stage that is what if, if you're not familiar with the term world-class program that is the the UK sport um, lottery funded aspect um, whereas the the previous elements are funded by the home nation um, sports councils or organizations confirmation is a new stage in the world-class program um, across the UK sports system and in reality it's there as the first stepping stone um, to really help athletes kind of transition into being a world-class program athlete, give them experience of, of what that's like, allow them to start working individually with more practitioners um, and really start to sort of begin their journey as a, as a performance athlete. You then move on to podium potential, which is a, a stage which existed for, for quite a long time. Um, and the, the podium potential program is there um, in essence to take the athletes who have come through confirmation are starting to develop and show that they may have potential to move on to the podium in the future. Um, and they have quite a lot of support put around them. Um, but again, they're still encouraged to, to find their own way. 
And then finally, the podium programme is for effectively the sort of top hitters who are aiming for the, the very top of the podium um, in the next, well, within the, the, the cycle you're in um, at the Games. Um, they tend to have a very individualised plan. Um, the athletes on there would be very much in control of, of their programme themselves. Um, they're not over-reliant on the, the coaches and so on. Um, they obviously use the coaches, they use the support staff, but, but they're very much um, part of that process themselves and, and making that call. Just the other part in this diagram, just to make you aware of, the arrows, um, the, the blue arrows that come in are entry points into the, the pathway in terms of talent ID activity. Um, so you may, after a talent ID event, go into clubs, um, you may go into the academy, um, and the red arrows are talent transfer, and that's when you come in um, potentially directly from another sport, um, and often we may get athletes um, at a world-class programme level coming in sort of to that confirmation space, space from another one. Um, an example, if any of you are aware of the athletes in our programme um, currently is Claire Cashmore, um, who was on programme at swimming and, and had a very successful um, career as a swimmer and moved across for this cycle into um, paratriathlon um, and has then moved through and is now a, a podium athlete with us. So just to give you um, a bit of an idea, um, we're in the, the process of, of launching our strategy. Um, part of that strategy um, within this, you'll see a, a similar document. Well, you'll, you'll see a number of similar documents between Dan and I, which, which speak slightly differently. Um, but look very similar. So the, this basically talks to um, what, is our, what are our objectives and strategies. And, and on the paratriathlon one, just very quickly, um, we're looking to increase the depth and quality of, of our pathway programs. And that is very much the, the sole focus of what we're doing. And the things that feed into that is an extensive program of talent introductions. And that is talent ID, that is talent transfer. And that's also developing really positive relationships with the, the constituent sports of triathlon um, and, and working with them in a, in a really collaborative way to, to help both them and, and, and also ourselves. Um, there's also providing bespoke support for the athletes as they enter the pathway um, and make sure that once they're in there, we give them what they need. Um, again, I'll talk about this as I go on, but our athletes have, um, at times have very specific needs depending on the type of impairment they have and the background they have um, and making sure that we, we hone that and do the best job possible with that is, is really important. Um, and then finally, the other one is delivering a world-class uh, national classification program. And that's something which, um, again, I'm gonna give a bit on this, but we need to make sure we classify athletes really, really well um, so that if they do move on to international um, level, they don't change classification um, at that point, because that can cause, um, most, most particularly, it can cause a lot of uh, discomfort for the athlete um, and can change things an awful lot for the athlete. So, um, our talent ID is, is really our entry point on, uh, again, Dan will obviously talk about the Olympic, but where they have like academy trials and stuff, this is our equivalent, but we, uh, we bring people in um, with a vast array of different backgrounds um, some of them may be athletes who are already competing in the sport um, and are looking to progress on. Um, some may have dropped out of another sport, maybe competing in another sport. And the sporting backgrounds of the athletes who go on to be successful are, are really vast and varied. Out of 14 athletes we had in Rio, we had 11 sort of different sort of main sporting backgrounds. So there really is quite, quite a variety. Um, this is some work that we've started already. Um, we, um, we've launched a campaign recently for Talent ID um, and we have an online virtual session on Saturday um, and we've had absolutely huge success. Um, it kind of outstrips what we've, what we've done in the past by like three times in terms of the number of people that have signed up um, and we're really excited about that. Um, we've, we've done a lot of work to make that happen um, because we've realized that, well, we, we knew that we, uh, we had a bit of an undersupply of athletes in our, in our pathway. Um, we had big plans uh, to do a big campaign off the back of Tokyo last year. Um, obviously, that did not happen. Um, but again, we will be doing so um, this year. And at that, athletes come along, they get, um, they receive information about the sport, um, about classification, about how they get started, how they progress. Um, and then there's also a testing element. Um, this time round, with it being virtual, the testing element will be done 
again remotely um, and then we'll, we'll move people in from there. Um, for the campaign in the summer, um, we've enlisted a, a media agency who are really helping us to, to reach out to new audiences and, and people we haven't really been able to sort of speak to, so to speak, previously. Um, and, and that's something, again, that's, that's really exciting and an area that we're, we're putting a massive amount um, of our time and effort into um, so that we can maximise our chances of, of, of seeing the right athletes and, and then having them and helping them to develop. Um, so I've mentioned classification a little bit. Cla basically, Paralympic sport without classification doesn't really work. Um, every single sport has that, that has a Paralympic side um, has a different classification system. The classification system is, is designed to um, find out how an impairment would impact on that, particular, um, on that particular sport. And obviously, in our case, that's how an impairment impacts the three different sports um, and then pulling that together, depending on how you move through. Um, we have six different types of categories, um, but an athlete basically has to have a, a classification to be able to actually enter the pathway, not to come to a talent ID event, but to enter the pathway after that. Um, partly because what some athletes sit right on the border between eligible and non-eligible. Um, and one of the key things that, that we always try to do is, is to treat people um, in the best way possible. We want to give people a positive experience um, and we don't want to sell someone a dream that isn't real. Um, and if somebody is right on the border of a, uh, of being eligible and non-eligible, um, then you know we wouldn't want to sort of sell them the dream that they were going to be able to compete in the sport um, if it later turned out they weren't. And so it's such a crucial part. Um, and and the team of of uh, of classifiers who who work for us um, are are pretty awesome um, and do a fantastic job of of doing that um, and have done that in the last few months in in very very trying circumstances. Um, but have again have excelled. So. Quick run through of the categories. Again, if anyone would like further information on any of this after today, then, then please do get in touch. Um, I can direct you towards the website as well, which has some of this. So we have a PTWC class, um, which is basic for those who use wheelchairs um, permanently or who would need one to, um, to be able to compete in triathlon. We have the PTS two, three, four, and five, which are what we class as the ambulant or standing categories. Um, and that is a variety of, of different athletes from amputees, those with cerebral palsy, other neurological impairments, um, and basically a type of impairment where an athlete can ride um, a solo bike um, themselves um, and can run. And then we have PTVI, which is our visually impaired category um, and, and caters for our, our visually impaired athletes. So the academy, as I say, this is, is a new structure for us. Previously, we've worked with um, with just having effectively before world-class program, a talent squad. Um, and we basically found uh, we didn't have uh, the scope to, to really give the athletes the best, the best possible experience. Um, and in many ways, what we're doing now is looking at mirroring um, what the Olympic pathway have done before, but as I say, in a slightly different way. So when our athletes come through Talent ID, as I say, some of them will come from various backgrounds. Um, and it's therefore really, really vastly important that we establish a really good daily training environment for them. Um, for those of you not familiar with that term, it basically means the clubs they go to, the coaches they work with, um, and, and how they, they access that and how they, they work with people. Um, sorry, I jumped on a slide. Um, we're looking um, in the fairly near future, not too immediately, but fairly near future, um, to recruit two or three part-time roles, um, which, uh, we hope we'll be able to uh, support the athletes in that point. Part of the reason for this and why it's so crucial is obviously not every area of the country necessarily has junior triathlon clubs. Um, and where they do, um, again, it's whether or not how well they, they cater for an athlete who has an impairment, um, hopefully very well, um, but obviously that can never be guaranteed. Um, and also one of the challenges is we may have athletes who are potentially absolutely world-class um, but due to the nature of their impairment, they're not as fast as other, as other athletes and therefore fitting them in either to swimming clubs or running clubs or cycling clubs or triathlon clubs um, and giving the best experience can be, can be more of a challenge. Not all the time. We've had absolutely brilliant experiences of athletes being superbly supported in clubs, but we just want to make sure that we, we maximize the opportunity for that to happen. 
Um, within this stage, athletes are exposed to um, fun, engaging swim, bike and run experiences. We're there to add value and, and the, the fun part and, and really engaging them in the sport is really key. Um, exposing them to the basics of, of the sport um, and beginning to also understand their impact of their impairment on swim, bike and run and what that aspect that has for training, what it has for equipment adaptations or prosthetic needs um, are all areas that, that can have quite a big impact for athletes. Um, obviously, educating parents, we say parents and partners, um, because often where we have our older athletes, um, they're not necessarily based at home with parents anymore, but um, they may have partners, they may have children, um, and therefore making sure that we, we take them along the journey as well as we can and make, keep them educated is absolutely important, vitally important. Um, and then also, because we have so many athletes that do come from our single discipline sport, they'll have fantastic uh, skill sets. Um, and it's really important that we, we enable them to be transferred into, into the triathlon context. So the next gen um, aspect, this is a program that basically moves the athletes onto the next level. Um, they, the athletes within it still stay as part of their academy, but they, um, they also then get a little bit more bespoke support and that helps them start to transition um, a little bit further up. Um, and this is where we work really collaboratively um, across the home nations. Um, this is about developing that functional and supported um, training environment. It's about exploring and beginning to really understand um, aspects of paratriathlon performance rather than just triathlon itself. Um, exploring boundaries and being innovative around the impact of their impairment um, and the equipment on swim, bike and run. And by that, I mean, there are, when trying to find the right combination of various impairment, um, of various prosthetics or bits of kit, um, when you have um, quite um, sometimes individual impairments is, is sometimes how you start really gaining and, you know, making big gains and it's something that's really, really important um, and, and something that a lot of athletes really love about it, um, that kind of problem solving nature. Um, we're then starting to prepare them and support them through life transitions. Again, where the Olympic program would potentially talk about them transitioning into university programs and centers. For us, sometimes it's, it's around athletes. Sometimes it is the same as that, but with some of the older athletes, it's around them possibly beginning to move away from work towards part-time work or, or towards full-time training, depending on the nature of it. Um, and it's our job to, to support them in what they do um, and make sure they develop as, as people really as a real key part rather than just as a just as triathletes, because if we develop them well as people, they're far more likely to be um, successful. Again, we further on the parents and partner stuff and transferring the single discipline expertise and um, not just getting them into the, but really starting to be an area where they excel and a super strength within the sport. Um, so uh, I think this is my last slide. Um, so the super series, um, again, mirroring what, what we do on the Olympic side, um, this is where they, they really learn to compete in the paratriathlon context. A lot of our athletes um, can go out and compete um, day in, day out, week in, week out in, uh, in a lot of other events around the, the country, um, and they do so. Um, but those, uh, those events are set up for everyone, whereas the paratriathlon events are sometimes set up slightly differently. And um, they go in waves depending on the, um, their category. Um, and again, they, there is things set on um, as standards, such as support out of the water for those who, who need it. Um, there is a uh, support, um, like there may be like as standard chairs and transition for those that need it again, uh, prosthetic users and the like. Um, it's a real focal point um, for the para triathletes in the country and it's, it's a real opportunity for them to, to get engaged in their sport. Um, it's where they can start learning how to deliver one day, one race. Um, and by that, for those not familiar with it, means basically bringing your absolute A game on the race that really matters for you. And again, what race that is for each athlete will, will differ, but it gives them the opportunity to start doing that and a, a real focal point. Um, they are also races that are used for selection um, onto international events. So that's um, a big motivator for people. Um, additionally, athletes get a chance to learn and develop how to race in the international context. We set our races up the same as they would be internationally. And um, gaining international starts can be a challenge um, within our sport and, and within the sheer numbers taking part and the number of events that we have opportunity to access. Um, 
And then finally, the, the series as it is, is, is something that is new, um, is developing, um, and it, you know, we hope to develop it further as the participation base grows. So I will go on mute and stop talking um, and hand you over to uh, Dan. Thanks, Alistair. Evening, everybody. Unfortunately, can't see you all. Well, um, but uh, yeah, good evening. And um, yeah, welcome to uh, 20 minutes, maybe a bit less if you're lucky, of uh, the Olympic pathway. So um, yeah, we'll move on a slide, please, Alistair. So very much, as Alistair said, very similar. Um, we, we've done a lot of work um, in the last sort of uh, 18 months, um, particularly um, in bringing both of the pathways together using a common language and very much sort of um, presenting how we work in a, in, a, in a very similar way. We're in the process, and I'll talk about it a little bit at the end, of developing a prospectus jointly, um, which is part of our sort of UK funding submission. Um, but yeah, very much working on an aligned sort of Olympic and Paralympic pathway as much as we possibly can. Um, so our stages are very similar. Um, and um, Academy, you'll all know about Next Generation, as Alistair said, is a rebranding, if you like, of the, uh, the Home Nation programmes. So um, for uh, England, that's the ENG programme, England Next Generation programme. Um, and um, obviously Wales and Scotland run similar programmes. Uh, confirmation is quite an interesting stage, I think, for us going forward. Um, we're very much looking um, at trying to what we would call sort of blur lines, if you like, a little bit between the next generation pathway, um, the sorry, the next generation stage, uh, the confirmation stage and the podium potential stage, getting athletes to be able to mix across those stages um, and being able to deliver sort of camp and competition opportunities that are more sort of needs assessed through that entire group of athletes rather than just, you know, those three stages sort of training, uh, doing camps and going to competitions in silos, if, 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 if that makes sense. Um, so really quite excited by the opportunities that the, the confirmation stage um, will allow. It also gives, um, as Alice has said, opportunity for the athletes to, to really sort of get under the bonnet of what it's like to be in a world-class program, but it does so without the pressures of needing to achieve results. Um, so at podium potential level, um, if you go on, you know, you've got, to, you've got to get a result. You've got to keep moving forward. Once you're on the world-class podium potential program, you have to keep moving forward. And confirmation gives athletes just a little bit of breathing space to enable them to sort of get their feet under the table, I suppose, um, and support them with sort of finding out what it's, what it's like without, without that pressure of results. Um, and again, like I say, I think if we can blend that um, with um, all three Home Nation Next Generation programs, that gives us um, a really nice sort of uh, more sort of smooth, if you like, transition through through that part of the um, through that part of the pathway. And transitions, particularly, is something that we, as a pathway on the Olympic side, need to need to be a lot better about. Uh, need sorry, need to be a lot better at. Um, and I'll talk in a little bit more detail in a sec about um, about that. Um, obviously, podium, as Alice has said, is is where our top athletes reside. Um, and it's you know this is it's exactly it's all about what we're trying to do with the pathway is, is support athletes with moving through the stages um, to enable them to you know to stand on an Olympic or a or a world world championship podium. Uh, next slide, please, please, Alistair. So. Um, I'm not sure where you, where your sort of gallery view will be. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to talk more about the left-hand half of the slide. So that's probably the bit that you want to see here. Um, very much like Alistair, this is our um, Triathlon England um, strategy, but it's very similar to what the Welsh and Scottish programmes are working towards as well. Um, and we're spending a lot um, of time, particularly um, with Triathlon Scotland, Triathlon Wales, in, in, in starting to align strategies much much more but you know we we work very closely we have a very good working relationship um, across the three home nations um, and do a lot of um, a lot of our work at super series level uh, academy and home nation level together so um, our, our three uh, key objectives i've already mentioned in transitions transitions is something that uh, frankly uh, the england program particularly has 
hasn't done very well um, in the in the in the very sort of near past. Um, something we did a little better, I think, um, in in probably sort of the 2016 cycles and, and and before, but certainly more recently, it's not something we've done very well. There's a number of reasons for that, um, obviously, and we're very aware of those, and we've made some very distinct changes to how the England program runs. And I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail um, in a second, but a lot of those changes are specifically supporting athletes to make better transitions. And the, the second objective as well is also um, dealt with, if you, with, the, with some of the changes, well, with the changes we're making at, at um, ENG level two. So that's around athletes having strong foundations um, to meet the demands for the sport. Um, so obviously a little bit more sort of on the physical side, um, and I'll talk in, in a little bit more detail about what we're doing um, about that and how we're supporting athletes to have those strong foundations. I think probably the one thing to really highlight at this point is that it's we're not focusing just on individual racing anymore. We are driving a relay strategy. It's, it aligns very much with the world-class program as well. There is a line in the world-class strategy around relay development as well. Uh, we really feel we need to strategically, um, we, we've kind of been going at it, if you like, for the last four years, obviously, um, but we probably haven't been as overt as maybe we should have been. Um, and we very much need to develop culturally further down the program, an idea around um, relays being as important as individual racing. Um, and particularly with the sort of heats finals format coming in as well, the, the shorter racing, um, and the skills required to, to do well in those formats of racing are going to become more and more important. So the, the, the quicker we can start to develop more of a relay stroke short racing culture, um, the better for us. And then finally, uh, the final objective is around an aligned and inclusive pathway. And again, this speaks a lot to the England programme in particular being far more effective. Um, and again, I'll talk a little bit about that and the changes that we're making. Um, but yeah, basically, um, the England programme is almost the glue, if you like, the whole, um, the, the sort of academy structure, if you like, and the sort of more regional um, structure, particularly in England, is the glue that holds that together with the world class programme. So it's really, really important for us that the England programme particularly um, functions well. And I think, you know, the Scottish and Welsh programmes in that sense have been functioning in a much more aligned fashion of late than the England programme has. So we've made some, some big changes, as I say, to address all three of these, these key objectives. Um, so Alistair, if you, if you want to move on a slide. So, um, so what what are those changes and and um, you know what are we what are we doing what are we doing at England level? Well, basically um, we've completely um, changed the 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 support the athlete support model um, at uh, England Next Generation ENG level. Um, we've um, just recently appointed two of the three England athlete leads, and we'll be um, appointing a third a third person. Um, in around sort of September time. Those uh, ENG athlete leads will be looking after around uh, anything from around seven uh, to nine to 10, depending on the size of the program. We've got probably generally around a 24 athlete program. So it's an average eight per coach. Um, and they will be split into North, uh, Midlands and South. Um, and they will be um, really well supporting those athletes in their in their daily training environment, what we would call DTE, daily training environment. So that means getting out, visiting them, giving them the remote support they need. It doesn't mean necessarily coaching them. Um, it does mean coaching them if they don't have a triathlon coach. You know, a lot of our kids are in a swimming club and a running club. And they're not lucky enough to have a triathlon coach that's really able to fulfill their 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 needs at the level that they're that they're at so if those athletes do need coaching um the eng leads will coach them but if they do have a coach obviously we're working with that coach and supporting them in that home environment um, and that's very much speaking to the, developing the strong foundations with the objective that we talked about earlier uh, the second the second key thing that we're the the england athlete leads are doing is um supporting athletes with transitions um 
you know, when you stop and think about it, you've got three academic transitions generally when an athlete steps through a path, when a lot of our athletes have got big academic aspirations. So that's GCSEs, A-levels and onto degree. Um, most of our athletes, most of our athletes do degree. It's not the only way. And I want to be really clear about that. It's not the only way. And we're very flexible to support athletes with whatever's best for them. And Project 18 that's highlighted here. And uh, for those of you that haven't seen that, that's a resource online. Um, that we have in place to support athletes to make better decisions um, around, around their uh, key transition when they leave school at 18. Um, but so you've got academic transitions, you've got sporting transitions, so um, youth to junior to senior, you've got pathway transitions, you've got the transition where most athletes are gonna at some point in their pathway journey leave home. Um, you know, there's, there's at least for most athletes change of coach, um, maybe once or twice through that period, we're talking about 15 to 16 transitions and a lot of them happen in the in the next generation space. So we need to do a more effective job of supporting athletes, not just with the decision making process that sits around transitions, but also with the skills and abilities. So they so they're absolutely able to thrive when they whenever they move on to do something else. Um, you know, we've too many athletes who, you know, the, the, the very obvious example for us in the Olympic pathway is kids moving away from home when it comes to university age to go and train and study at one of our centers. And too many athletes losing a year or more because they just don't have the skills, the abilities to manage. Um, they're going to centers that they don't really know enough about. Centers aren't really sure if they're who, who's coming. There's all sorts of, um, stuff that's not being done very well um, in in that area and like i say uh, the majority of that is in the with the england program um, and that's why we're sort of looking at making these these changes um, a line camp and competition program um, so that's very much working as we have done for the past sort of six to eight years with the other two home nations to deliver a lot of our, our main camp programs um, it's also looking um, outside of the main three camps, so summer, winter and Easter, uh, getting athletes into um, centres um, and, and exposing them to centres on weekend camps, um, half term camps um, and really doing all that we can to really support those those transitions, as well as. Um, ensuring that the athletes to the top of the home nation program have got aligned opportunities with the confirmation athletes and the world class athletes and we're really starting to to step that process forward expose them to those environments earlier and allow them to um, see the next level up you know that ability if you like to see the next level up is hugely important for athletes as they step through from one stage to the next um, and then finally i've talked about it already aligning the pathway so thank you alistair uh, for moving me on. Um, so academy, um, I think it's probably, um, yeah, more of the same really from academies. Um, you know, our strategy is very much speaking to the England space, performing more effectively um, and not, not, not the academy space uh, necessarily. We're very happy with a, a lot of the work that goes on in academies. Um, so Alistair, if you want to flick on a bit, um, flick on a slide, please. I'll just talk very briefly about um, what academies are about and what academies aren't about, if that makes sense. So academies are very much about exposing athletes to, to the sport, as Alice has kind of alluded with, with his academy as well. Um, and, and with that, I think very important for us is around developing a triathlete's identity. So more often than not, athletes will come into our pathway at 15, 16, and they might be they might do a bit of triathlon, but they're often somebody that does some swimming. They might even be a swimmer. And that's what they call themselves or they might be an athlete or they might be a cyclocross rider or whatever um, so most of our kids aren't identifying fully as triathletes until 15 16 and that's a good thing you know we don't want people specializing terribly early we want people sampling lots of different sports um, you know that that's that's absolutely important um, but what is also important is athletes when they start um, in our pathway they start to understand more about triathlon and start to develop that identity and start to fall in love with our sport very much along the lines if you can see on the outside of the diagram we've got the six pillars of the athlete development framework and training as play is the pillar that we deliver most really at academies it's about supporting athletes to fall in love with our sport it's about exposing athletes to add value above and beyond experiences stuff that they can't get at home um, you know it's tremendously tremendously powerful 
um, those two elements about building identity and that exposure to these um, above and beyond opportunities. Um, and with that, then there's very much the exposure to, to triathlon basics. So planning, training, racing, nutrition, et cetera. It's very much not about performance, about delivery of performance. It's about learning some basics and, and experimenting and exploring, um, exploring those basics. So academies definitely aren't about um, giving athletes bespoke coach programs. Um, we employ academy coaches for two days a week and they're absolute, they absolutely don't have time to get into all of the athletes training environments and to give them bespoke programs. Um, it's more about signposting, about giving them information, about supporting them with the basics at the start of their pathway journey. Um, and, it, and it's absolutely not about um, direct um, coaching support or about replacing, you know, if any of you guys are coaching academy athletes, um, we want you to keep coaching academy athletes. Um, we're absolutely not um, expecting academy coaches to replace uh, any club coaches or any other coaches um, in the coaching of academy athletes. Just there, they are there to support those athletes. And that support, obviously, um, particularly at DTE, at um, daily training environment level, becomes much more focused, much more bespoke, much more individual when an athlete steps into the England programme. Okay, Alice there. So just um, quickly, um, and to, 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 to round things up, the Super Series. So, um, you know, the Super Series is, is absolutely, I think, um, you know, it's obviously athletes in our pathway want to race um, and racing is very important. Um, and, you know, we do our absolute best through academies, through the programme, through our messaging to parents, to drive home the sort of um, the message, I suppose, that the Super Series is about learning and development. It is not about outcome. Um, there's a, one race in the entire youth and junior pathway that is about performance delivery. That's about delivering an outcome. And that's the World Junior Championships. Every other race, the European Championships, European Youth Championships, um, the Super Series, Super League, School Games, all of those other events is about athletes learning and developing, about athletes exploring their performance, about athletes being exposed to different types of races. Um, so it's really important that we drive that message home. And I would say the same really to, to kids competing at regional series level. Um, the races are there for their learning and development. Um, I do believe that all of that said that the Super Series is a world leading series. We have more numbers in our in our um, national youth and junior series at a higher level um, than um, probably any other country uh, aside from France. But I think we do a better job than the French um, in in pulling our race series together and giving kids different um, exposures, to different opportunities, different types of courses um, and really thinking hard about what we put in front of them. Um, in races. We are constantly adapting the series. Obviously, we didn't have a series last year, but a lot of the stuff that we were going to do last year, we're going to bring in to the series that we hope that we can have this year, fingers crossed, post uh, middle of June. Um, so some of the stuff that will be coming into the series this year is, is, is aquathlon. And that's not just a one race aquathlon, that's three races in one day aquathlon. And very much like the um, event we have at Hetton, which has a heats and finals and relay, we have a big belief in supporting athletes to do as much racing as possible. Um, you know, one of the disadvantages of our sport, if you like, is that athletes don't have a lot of opportunity to race. If you're a swimmer, you're racing probably almost at points once a week. Um, athlete, athletes can race once a week, might not be healthy, but there's an opportunity to do that. Cyclists can race two or three times a week at points, depending. Um, in triathlon, it's more like eight to 10 times a year. So when we are bringing athletes together to races, we want them to have an opportunity to race more than once wherever possible. Um, and the aquathlon is particularly uh, with three races in one day, all of different distances. Um, we're really trying to drive that home, present them with three different swimming courses. Um, swimming in our world is a very fluid um, in, in open water swimming uh, from a, um, a, a, you know, a start when everybody's starting together. Um, it's a very fluid dynamic environment that requires an awful lot of decision making. So presenting athletes with lots of different swimming opportunities of that type is really important for us. Swim distances. Um, um, there might be one or two questions on this and but more than happy if there are. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about this. We were going to increase youth swim distances last year. 
and we are going to increase youth swim distances from sort of three, 400 metres to more like four, 500 metres, but toward the end of the year. So the last two races in the Super Series, we'll see an increased distance for, um, for youth athletes. And then obviously also um, the other thing that we're conscious of is ensuring that the Super Series, not just the youth and junior Super Series, but the senior Super Series also supports our best under 23 athletes with um, exposure to a good level of domestic racing and opens up opportunities for them to um, progress to international racing at Conti Cup Senior, senior um, uh, Conti Cup, what we call Conti Cup, so ETU, European Cup level. Um, and then, yeah, I think finally on all of that, it, there's there's an awful lot of information. I've spent the last two days updating it all, actually, um, to go on probably in the next week onto the Youth and Junior Competition page. Um, and the link is there on the presentation um, for any of you that want to look at some of that information. There's some information up already, but specific information on this season will be up in, in the next in the next week or so, we hope. Um, and finally, um, I've already mentioned it, but um, as I said, as part of our UK sports submission, um, Alistair and I have been tasked, as all of the other Olympic sports, Paralympic sports have been tasked um, with developing a prospectus. And that basically us um, being really, really clear with athletes, parents, coaches about what the, the pathway offer is, about what we're trying to do, about the opportunities available, about what each stage will be like, um, and really trying to expand on that and give athletes as much information, parents and coaches, as much information as possible about our pathway. So a lot of what I've talked about, super series information, a lot of the um, stuff that's already online around the ADF or Project 18, all of this stuff, um, along with all of Alistair's stuff, will be included in one prospectus. Um, that hopefully, um, and uh, I say hopefully, um, people can actually find on a website because I know what a trial it is um, finding the talent pages on um, the British Triathlon website. So um, yeah, we've got some thinking to do about how how we do that. Whether we, um, you know, we've we've had discussions about potentially having our our own sort of sister website that's you know linked into the British Triathlon website, or we wait. There's a you know a new website coming and we, we maybe we maybe wait for that but yes that perspective should be with us at some point in the next 12 months and uh, i think that's it from me isn't it Alistair? um it is yeah um i can see loads that there are loads of questions i just can't see what any of them are um as i'm currently sharing so do you do you want me to read them out to you Alistair? well to myself or or, or daniel or dan yeah, yeah. um so there's a there's a, a few in here from uh, Christine. Um, the first one is how are we IDing the athletes currently from clubs, and as a point of pure interest, what seems to be the average age ages for entry and retirement? I think that was a para question, Alistair. I assume mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I noticed that come in when you were talking. Um, the so the work we've done so far um, has been, as I say, we. In really honest, we don't get that many athletes that come directly from clubs. Um, I'm aware that there are quite a large number of athletes who, who compete in the sport as a whole um, who don't necessarily compete in the Paralympic side of it. Um, and again, we always have to be careful that just because um, somebody has an impairment doesn't mean that they necessarily want to move on. But again, if they do, um, we are more than, than happy to, to facilitate that and to try and help them move to the next level um, if they're at the right stage. Um, we work with athletes from the age of 14 upwards. Um, we, we actually, for the talent ID this weekend, we have some 13 year olds who will, um, sort of by the time they're ready to move on, would be about 14. There isn't really a top age. Um, it really varies between categories. I could probably be here all night if I went into the sort of age demographic of each category, but certain categories um, tend to have different age profiles. So for example, the wheelchair athletes, um, by and large, tend to be a little bit older. Um, Whereas sometimes the PTS5 athletes, for example, tend to be a bit younger. So there's a real variation there. Um, have I answered all of that, Pete? Or have, is it a bit I've missed? I, I think so, unless Christine wants to unmute. Um, the, next, the next question from Christine was, um, how, how are we tri trialing or testing remotely? Um, that's a very good question, um, and, and I, if, if I'm, I'm really honest, this has been quite a challenge. Almost the sheer success of the numbers we've got for this weekend um, 
make it more of a challenge than we thought it was going to be. Um, and that's a, a fantastic position to be in, really. Um, athletes are going to be asked to submit um, performances across um, swim, bike and run. They've got, um, they'll have about six weeks to do it. This is from an English perspective. Um, it will be slightly different in Scotland and Wales. Um, and, and we're working, those guys are working, um, we'll be working with their, the athletes from their countries. Um, we appreciate that, particularly at that level, not all athletes will be um, necessarily able to do all three disciplines because of natures of um, prosthetics or particular types of bikes and so on. Um, so we're looking for athletes to put, sort of be able to provide us with what they can. Um, we will then have a look at, at what those performances are. We have some, some sort of basic guidelines as to sort of minimum entry times, um, but they have a degree of flexibility depending on um, sort of age and stage of development um, and, and length of time within the sport or the discipline. Um, we certainly don't ask for athletes to be at that level in all three um, at that stage. And um, yeah, we will then, with those that, that show the most interest, we will then look at um, either going and visiting them or bring them into some central locations. Um, but obviously COVID um, and various restrictions has a very big part to play in that. And um, so we have to work within that, that context, which is why we're doing it in quite the way we are, but we will use a virtual start for all future um, campaigns just because of the, the, sh the sheer ease of being able to engage with a large number. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, and, and just one more from Christine. She said, thank for, fantastic to the last answer. Um, just, is there any help for discontinuation transition in power trial or otherwise um i.e retirement planning um in in many ways i, don't, I did I, I talked a little bit about developing people but within both of our pathways in in reality part of what you're doing is is preparing the athlete for moving on um as soon as they come in um, and that doesn't mean you're getting them out the door the first minute they come in it's making sure that we really develop them as effectively as we can as people um, so that they have a lot of skills um, and, and relevant skills and ones that, that are really good for them. It's really important, um, you know, for us, you don't make the sort of money if you're successful on the Paralympic side that you do on the Olympic side. And therefore, even our most successful athletes have to have a lot in the background to, to really help them move on um, and make sure that they've got a future career. So we do what we can. Once they get onto world-class program, they have more time in generally because they're effectively paid to be there. Um, and, and we have the ability to provide them with, with courses that they want to do and relevance that they want to do. So whether that be that they go into coaching courses um, in triathlon or a single discipline, um, or whether that be some of them go into public speaking courses, um, and some of them may just go into courses really particular to, to a sort of a future professional career that's got nothing to do with triathlon, but, but something that they want to move into yeah um and christine christine said thanks Alistair. it would be nice to know where to direct um a power try for power try equipment further down the line um so yeah um i presented I guess on that on tuesday night <laughs> <laughs> um if if people want to know some of that we are trying to develop the website um again as with dan section to be honest I, it's not as good as it could be in terms of um, some of the stuff around people like the general participation population getting involved as opposed to the performance pathway. Um, so we're trying to develop that. But if people really want to know, they can contact myself. And my yeah. email address is my name as it is written there um, and spelt there at British Triathlon. So, Yeah, thank you, Alistair. And not to let Dan off the hook, um, <laughs> what message can you help coaches with? Reference getting the message out there, reference outcomes to parents and athletes to remove pressure and improve enjoyment. Yeah, and I mean, I, and, I, and I guess development from that as well. Yeah, it's 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 a difficult one. Um, you know, I do I do appreciate that, but I think you know, uh, direct people, um, you know, to our to our competition pages, um, particularly in the pathway. Um, so, if any of the athletes are competing at Super Series level, you know, there isn't. A, a, you know what I would say is a good amount of information um, on on our competition page around um, the super series and particularly around our learning. Um, you know our philosophies around learning and development um, that are strongly attached to the series. Um, yeah, and and again, I think um, you know if athletes are good enough and can get into an academy 
um, the, the messaging from academy coaches is very much in that vein. Um, so if coaches are, I guess, maybe struggling to, to frame things potentially or to have an idea, then, then I'm sure there's an opportunity um, in most regions to, to engage with an academy coach, to go along and visit for a session or a day uh, and find out from them maybe how they're, how they're doing it. But it's, it, it, is, it is a difficult thing. I think, you know, I, we, one of the other things, I suppose, um, on that, so a bit of a rambly answer, it, we probably four years ago started to um, be a lot more proactive in, in terms of how we engage parents. Um, I think in the main, parents in our sport have high expectations for their kids, uh, quite rightly. Um, you know, academic expectations, sporting expectations, etc. Um, and I think the more um, we've engaged parents and the more we've um, given parents information, parents in our pathway tend to want to know stuff. And the more information we can give them, the better. So we've been as proactive as we can be over the last three or four years, including workshops of performance assessments, uh, a closed uh, group uh, pathway, a closed Facebook pathway group, get your words out. Um, and uh, that, that has really helped as well. So, you know, potentially, um, you know, if you have got parents in your club, just leveling with them more and speaking to them more and bringing them in more and supporting them more with understanding um, uh, how, how the sport works and the importance of learning and development for younger athletes. Yeah, thank you, Dan. And uh, Christine has just said there, uh, yeah, she said thanks. And, and she thinks it's about setting expectations, as you, you've said. Um, but sadly, the overcompetitiveness starts at um, TriStar, uh, TriStar 2 due to the IRCs from her experience. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but that leads on to the next question that's come in from Rosa from West Midlands. Um, will potential IRC dates uh, details be included in the updates that you're providing? Uh, yes, Rosa. Um, um, we're hoping to get stuff out regards IRC. Um, as you probably know, I'm trying to get, um, or I am in communication with the IRC managers at the moment, um, and we're trying to get some feedback from everybody. Um, I've had probably 50% come, people come back, so I'm just waiting really um, to get full as, as full of feedback as I can from um, all of the regions plus Wales and Scotland um, around what we're doing, but it's highly likely that there will be some form of IRC um, on the second weekend of September aligned to the British Triathlon Super Series Grand Final at Mallory Park. Yeah, um, I think that's all the questions, unless there's any, any more. Um, there's none in the, the chat room at the moment. A lot of thank yous from uh, Rosa and Christine uh, for answering their questions. Um, that's it. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed tonight and the presentations by Alistair and Dan. Um, these are being recorded and they will be released um, shortly. And everyone that attended the uh, conferences and were signed up for them will be, will be able to get the recordings and obviously the one that uh, Dan did on uh, Tuesday night that links into this, the developing of young uh, triathletes will also be available for those that may have missed it um, I also hope that um, you're, um, you'll be in time at 9 o'clock to catch up with our last session of the week which is with Mark Buckingham um, who will be taking questions and answers from the audience so Thank you very much for attending tonight. Dan, Alistair, thank you very much for presenting. Um, and everyone have a very good evening. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for your time. Bye.